Uh, our next speaker uh, that I have the pleasure of introducing is, is a friend to many of us here and certainly well known to most of the people in this room one way or another. Uh, Gord Ellis uh, from Thunder Bay has been sharing his outdoor experience in print and radio and television for almost 30 years. He's been on the masthead of our great magazine Ontario Outdoors since 1992 and senior editor of the publication for the last eight years. Gord's column Open Range obviously appears in every issue of the magazine. He's written for a wide range of other publications as well, from North American Fisherman to Financial Post, and over the years he's won uh, 25 uh, media awards nationally. Beside his work in the print media, Gord has had a long career as a reporter for CBC Radio, which goes back to the mid-1980s. He's heard every Thursday on CBC uh, Thunder Bay talking about the outdoors in his long-running segment. Behind all his work in multimedia is a love of the outdoors and in particular fishing and hunting. He comes from a long line of hunters. He still hunts with his 77-year-old father and has passed along his love of hunting to his two sons who have embraced the lifestyle. He hunts and fishes for many species but has a real passion for brook trout and white-tailed deer which I think will be self-evident from his comments today. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Gord Ellis. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You guys ready to uh, talk about deer hunting? Or listen to a little talk? I'm really uh, very, very honored to be here. Uh, when Angelo asked me, I thought, oh God, he's going to ask me like, to talk about the future of the CBC or something really depressing. Um, but I really like talking about deer hunting a lot. And... Uh, it's, it's probably, I mean, you know, obviously wear a lot of hats, do a lot of different things, but I feel most like myself when I'm deer hunting. And I don't know, I, how many deer hunters do we have in here? Just about everybody, right? You guys, like, is deer hunting the best thing? It's pretty close, right? Some are moose hunting, deer hunting. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, um, like, I live in northwestern Ontario. Uh, there's a few of us here. Actually, I've noticed that uh, Len Hunt and I, we share similar hairlines, but there are people in Thunder Bay who have hair, and Glenn Rivard is the proof of that. Um, but we've evolved a little farther along, um, and, and hair gets in the way of hats. So, um, but we're going to talk about uh, buck tactics in Ontario. I, I hunt in northwestern Ontario mostly, but a lot of this stuff will obviously um, cross over. Now, this huge buck... Uh, you may have heard of Mission Island in Thunder Bay, you may not have. It's right literally in Thunder, right in downtown Thunder Bay. It's about five minutes from one of the downtown cores. That deer lived there at one point. I think it's gone now. Uh, but I was just driving. It's a place you can go on a Sunday drive and, and go look at deer. We have about 90 deer right in the city. And you also may know that Thunder Bay is one of the places that has an urban deer hunt. Very successful, thanks in large part to actions by the OFAH. It's been phenomenally successful. But we're going to uh, go through a few things. I just uh, quickly will talk a little bit about my roots. I'm, I'm a hunter, but I come from a long line of hunters. Uh, my grandfather was a guy named Ori Ellis from uh, Smithville, Ontario. Anybody know where Smithville is here? That's where my father's from as well. Um, my grandfather, who is on the far right in this picture, probably about the same age I was when this picture was taken in 1950, um, they had a camp on Manitoulin Island called Ballyhoo. It was long-running deer camp. So those are Manitoulin and McGregor Bay deer. Look, look at those bucks. Isn't that something? It's amazing. My grandfather shot, I think the count was 136 bucks in his life. And those were in the days with no scopes and pushes. They got onto the points and uh, he was the shooter. And the rest were the, you know, the grunts, right? The young legs. Pushed them down the points and then my grandfather was sat at the end of the line and piled them up. He was a phenomenal shot, used uh, peep sights. He liked the 250, 3000, or the 308. Fantastic hunter. So um, that was my grandfather. My father, um, Gord Sr., who I still hunt with, as uh, Greg mentioned. Uh, I've hunted with him since I can remember. He got me my first gun when I was, I think I was 13 years old. Um, phenomenal human being. Fantastic hunter. Hunting was an 
integral part of my life and remains that way. And we still hunt together. I'm so happy he's in, he's in phenomenal health. And a lot of it has to do with he is one of the keenest anglers and hunters I've ever met. Like, he wants to go ice fishing still when it's minus 20. And I don't. Okay? He's 77. I'm 52. And he's ready to rock and roll. He's ready to go walk around in the bush in November when it's freezing. Um, still very keen. And then uh, here's my boys, Devin and Austin. They love to hunt. They grew up hunting. My uh, oldest son, Devin, shot his first deer when he was 13 years old. First time he ever went out. Uh, I think I shot my first deer when I was 29. So he got, he was well ahead of me. Now I grew up uh, when Thunder Bay and, and Northwestern Ontario didn't have a lot of deer. It was, it was really moose country. Like if we saw a deer track, it was pretty exciting. But that's changed a lot. We have a phenomenal phenomenal deer hunting now. Anyway, you're going to see some of these faces appear during the course of my little chat here, um, but I just wanted to introduce you to my family and, and uh, talk a little bit about my roots. So I'm from Northwestern Ontario. I just throw these pictures in because we do have, uh, we do have phenomenal deer hunting. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's only gotten better in the last few years. Uh, deer have really moved into what was traditionally moose range, places where I know many of you hunted moose for years, um, you're seeing a lot more deer and, and a lot less moose as we've been hearing. Um, but these deer are big, they have, you know, the, the bucks have big rocks, they're big bodied animals. It's very, very exciting. I mean, deer are such a, a splendid thing to hunt. So anyway, um, that uh, shot on the left there, that's near Nipigon, that's a huge deer, it was on the, standing on the side of the road. And there's another on the right, that's a Mission Island buck again, just a phenomenal antler growth. I'm not a trophy hunter, really. I, I, I just I hunt to eat venison. I, I like to eat venison. I do like big bucks. I've shot a few, um, but I'll I'll shoot a, a small one too. So we're going to talk. I'm just going to talk a, a, about a few techniques. Many of you will be familiar with these. Some of you may not be. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about calling and rattling, uh, stalking and spot, or uh, basically when you're on the ground. Ground blinds, which is something I like to do a lot. A little bit about rut timing, and uh, the, that's a big, that's an important factor. And then baiting and trail cameras, which I know a lot of you probably have interest in. So I'm just going to uh, talk a little. This is an animal I shot. Uh, it's about four or five years ago, and this was a really interesting deer because it, it played to the effectiveness of rattling and and calling. How many people have rattled and called for deer in here? Okay, so a fair number. Um, it's one of those techniques that uh, you have to learn to have faith in. It took me a long, long time to have any faith in either one. Um, but once I finally sort of got it down and saw how effective it can be, it, it's something that uh, I, I really enjoy doing. This, this deer, this was near Vermilion Bay. Now, Vermilion Bay is an area in the far west part of northwestern Ontario, beautiful deer country. Uh, lots of uh, pines, there's quite a bit of cutting has been done there in the last few years, uh, but really, um, up until fairly recently, really, really excellent deer hunting. We've had two really bad winters in a row, so that's knocked them down a bit. But on this particular day, I, it was about November 4th, it went into this uh, cut, just a little bit of, like we had snow on the ground November 4th. That's not unusual in northwestern Ontario. We get snow fairly early, and it stays right till May sometimes. Um, went in, saw some very fresh sign, Saw a couple of really nice scrapes, which are where the bucks scrape on the ground. And so I, I set up, and you, you always set up like you want to have a nice view, right? So I set up on this hill, and I had this nice view down. And uh, did a little bit of uh, calling and rattling, but I had this call that I'd, I was actually had been at the uh, sportsman show just uh, the year before, and somebody from Quaker Boy had given me this, this call. This is what it sounds like. It's a, it's a brawler call. <coughs> Sounds like a little pig, right? It's sort of a piggy sound. That's the vocalization that a, that a buck will make. So I was sitting up on this ridge, looking down. Um, wind was in my face. Everything was perfect. And uh, didn't see anything. Called again. Then I did a little rattling. I think I had a rattle bag, but so I made this sound. And it carries. That sound really, if you've ever actually heard Bucks fight in the bush. It, the sound really carries. And it was a beautiful, clear, crisp morning. Anyway, I sat there for about a half an hour and uh, did a couple 
did a couple different uh, turns of it, and then I heard something behind me. And I also had that feeling. You ever get that feeling when, the, like, somebody's watching you? You know, like, it's like eyes in the back of you. It's kind of weird. So anyway, I'm sitting there, and I just slowly, just slowly turn, and this buck was 10 yards behind me. It had, it had uh, in my wind, it had snuck up to my, my uh, rattle and call, and I just managed to get around and get a shot into him. But uh, he had snuck up, like, me to you. Very strange experience. But just, like, when I backtracked where he'd come from, he'd come from about 150 yards. He'd been with two does. He'd come all that way running to me when I was rattling and calling. So it can be pretty effective. And this was pre-rut, November 4th. We'll talk a little bit more about the rut in, in a bit. Uh, so rattling, like, you can use... These are, actually, uh, these are actually not real antlers. They look like real antlers, but these are like a polymer antler. I actually bought these a few years ago at Canadian Tire, and I, when I brought them up to the counter, the girl said, like, what are those? I said, well, these are actually for sale. Like, she thought I just brought them randomly into the store and <laughs> just carrying antlers around. No, actually, I bought them. And uh, so I use these, but uh, there's also these things called rattle bags that are uh, uh, very effective as well, and they're just a bag of like sticks that you rub together. It's a lot easier to stick that in your pocket. One other thing about uh, these is, if you're on Crown land, I wouldn't recommend like, you know, doing this. You know. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, either put them in a bag, sometimes you might even want to, I mean, it doesn't really matter what they look like. You, can, you could spray paint them red. Um, you, don't want to, uh, you don't want to be shaking antlers around. Private property, it's a slightly different di business. Uh, grunt tubes. Uh, this is a buddy of mine from Thunder Bay. This guy named Tom Armstrong. Very, very keen hunter. Very keen angler. Great guy. A police officer in Thunder Bay. Um, he is a huge grunt tube hunter. And uh, he shot this really beautiful buck a couple years ago. He grunted it in. And saw him coming a long, long away, ways away. On a, clear, on a clear, quiet day, a grunt tube, even though it's not very loud, you know, it's a, it's a fairly subtle sound. Again, I'll just... All right, it's a little louder, but... That carries a long ways. In, in the wind, not so much. Uh, but big bucks will come running for a grunt when it's, uh, when it's that time of the year. Again, tools of the trade, there's all sorts of different... Uh, I mean, the number of calls on the market now. I, when I grew up deer hunting, there was no such thing as deer calling. Never heard of it, right? Like, uh, nobody knew anything about vocalizations. And it's really been in the last 20 years that we've heard about them. And there's uh, all sorts of different kinds. Um, I generally use a grunt, but there's uh, growls and, and a whole bunch of other things. And then, again, there's the different kinds of rattles, the bags, the polymer. You can use real, real antlers sound really good, too. Um, I generally use smaller bucks for them, not so much the big bucks. You can, I mean, I mean, you can actually scare a deer away by rattling really aggressively, especially if it's a smaller buck. If it's a bigger buck, you're not going to scare them. If it's like a real big one, you're not going to scare them with hard rattling. But a smaller buck, you could spook them. Okay, here's a, a monster northwestern Ontario deer. Actually, my friends from OOD might recognize Bill Draper, who is the... Proofreader for Ontario to Doors, fantastic person. Uh, this is again up in Vermilion Bay a few years ago. Now Bill is one of these guys. He's from Toronto. You look at him, you'd never, you say, "No way, that guy's a hunter." He's just, he's, he's, you know, he is a, he's a killer. Bill Draper is serious business, and he he uh, he spends his whole year getting ready for the hunt. He goes on the treadmill and he he gets healthy and. And he gets out there, and he, uh, our joke is it's a Draper-esque buck, which means it's a big one. He's killed some big, big bucks. But this particular one, he uh, was using what's called a bleed can. Now, that's a different call. Anybody use bleed cans or bleed calls? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we got some in the know people here. This is, uh, this is the sound that does make. Or, again, it's sort of a barnyardy sound. There's different, some... This one's a squeeze, where you just can squeeze it. Some of them you just you tip it over. Anyway, this sound, this is uh, 
Bill was having a hard hunt this particular year. He liked to use grunt tubes, and, and he wasn't having any luck. So I had this bleed can. I said, you know, give it a shot, Bill. He can't do any harm. So he went into this cutover where we'd been seeing all sorts of sign, but no big bucks. And it was a, it was a cut with a really just nasty old cedar swamp that you would not want to go into. Like one of those places that you just don't go into. And he went to the edge of it, worked the bleat can a little bit, and he saw some movement, kind of looked through the cedars, could see a big deer. Um, anyway, he was trying to figure out a way to get a shot. He got winded, buck took off. And so he went inside the tree line a little bit and sat down, waited about 20, 20 minutes, did the bleat call again, and that buck, and bucks are pretty curious animals. All deer are curious. You think that you spooked them off, but they often don't go very far. That buck looped around and went into the open. And Bill got him. And it was, uh, I think we lost count at 18 points or some crazy thing. It was just an absolute monster buck. That thing lived in the swamp, probably never left it except for 10 days during the rut when it got goofy. And uh, it paid the price that year. But the bleak can, the bleak can fooled that guy. Again, all sorts of uh, different ones to choose from. Um, I think they pretty much all do the same thing. Now, uh, I started deer hunting when I was about 16, 17 years old. I like to say that I had the longest run of bad luck that you could have. I did not shoot a deer for 10 years when I started deer hunting. It took me 10 years to kill a deer. I, I missed them, I spooked them. Um, Everything happened, but um, one of the things that I, I did was learn how to, I learned how to screw up, so then I learned what not to do. Does that make sense? I did everything wrong. So once you've done everything wrong, there's only th good things left. So uh, what, the hardest thing to master, I think, is, is spot and stock or still hunting on the ground, because you are in that deer's element moving around, and they are so familiar, so familiar with everything in their area, um, the sounds, the smells, everything. And so when you're a human walking around with your big feet and scratchy material and bad breath and all that stuff, um, they can see you, hear you coming. So it's really, uh, it's a real art to be really good at it. And uh, I'm not sure I'm there yet. I've shot a fair number of spotting and stalking. Um, but you know, you have to, you have to remember not to move too quickly. We all move too quickly. We all uh, don't use our eyes enough to watch. And also we have to be very careful about the wind because deer have an amazing, amazing sense of smell. It's incredible how they can pick you up. Uh, but it's very exciting when you're able to sneak up on a buck or a doe and, uh, and take it cleanly. Um, those are all sorts of things to keep in mind when you're uh, spotting and stalking. I'll go through this stuff quick. Um, use the wind, I've mentioned that. Fresh snow. We have a lot of snow in northwestern Ontario, as it turns out, so that works out great. Um, always, uh, it's always great to see fresh tracks and, and uh, scrapes in the snow, stuff like that. Also, snow is great for a, a tracking game when you've shot a, a deer, obviously. Um, this, is what, this is one thing that was really, really, really hard for me to learn. Don't look for a whole deer. Like in your mind, you're going to see the deer with the rack, it's all going to be broadside, everything's going to be perfect. Most of the time when you're spotting and stalking, you see a leg. You might, you catch an ear movement. You, you catch uh, just, you know, a horizontal line where everything else is up and down. All that stuff, that's, uh, it takes a little while and that's where you have to stop and you have to look around. Antler flicks, tail flicks. Spooking an animal, you know. You do a lot, a lot. If you walk around and still hunt for deer, you spook a lot of animals. But the thing, again, I'll, I'll reinforce this. I can't tell you how many times I've spooked animals and sat down and that animal's come back to see what you were, especially during the rut or pre-rut. They get goofy, and, uh, and, and they want to know, know if you're another buck. They just, they'll come back around. They'll, they'll circle back. And uh, walk slowly, uh, especially in the bush. Take a lot of pauses. Um, and, and the other thing is, and this is just a personal preference, I always hold my gun. I, I rare, in fact, I don't even, I'll take my strap off my gun if I'm spocking and stalking. I want to be ready to shoot because if you're, if you're slung and the animal comes out, by the time you get out, you have to be very fast. So it's, uh, it can be a workout if you have a heavy gun, but I always carry my gun in my, my hands, ready to go. 
Ground blinds. Who, uh, who here hunts out of ground blinds at all? Okay, so not as many, but a few. Ground blinds are uh, something I've really come to enjoy hunting out of, especially when it's cold, um, because you can, uh, you can be a little warmer. They're also a great, uh, they're also a great way to take a new hunter out. Um, I'll go back here. We, as humans, we tend to be real fidgeters, and it's especially true of kids. Um, kids, I, I mean, I have a hard time sitting still. It's even tougher for a younger person to sit still. And ground blinds actually really help you get over that. Well, some, maybe, maybe you probably don't move around, right? No. You're still. But everybody else is fidgeting and on their phone and doing all that stuff. Um, ground blinds cover all that up. And they also hold some of the scent in, too, which is, which is a huge thing, because we stink to deer, badly. So that, and also um, you can set them up, in, especially in, not so much in crown land, but on private land, you can set them up, camouflage them, and they become part of the furniture. And that is a, that's a real keen thing. I hunt two pieces of property near uh, Thunder Bay that are private. I also hunt a lot of crown land, but there's two pieces of private property I hunt, and I have them set up with ground blinds, uh, and bait, um, and they become part of the furniture to the bucks. And I just, these are trail cam shots from a couple of years ago of two really nice bucks basically just walking down this trail. They walked right by the ground blind, and uh, it, it was there. I put it up in September, and it stays till December, and it becomes part of their furniture. It takes on the, the smells of the bush, and uh, they don't really pay any attention to them. And they, and they blend in. The new blind, ground blinds blend in incredibly well. They're camouflaged. They have really good material. They're not noisy. Um, yeah, I love them. Again, uh, great for uh, new hunters. This is my son Austin. A couple years ago, uh, he shot his uh, first buck and uh, also took another antlerless deer the same day. He was so excited um, out of a ground blind. And uh, he's, it was just a fantastic experience. I was able to sit with him for him to take it and... Uh, yeah, just, uh, just they're, uh, they're a great, great thing for, uh, for young people, especially they're a lot more comfortable, and also uh, cover up a lot of movement. Tree stands obviously are fantastic because you get up there and you have that view, right? That's what's great about tree stands. Like, but when it's minus 20, a tree stand gets old fast, right? Like really fast. And I, I watch these shows on television where these guys, uh, like they live in Georgia and they go to northern, November, or northern Saskatchewan in November and sit all day in a tree stand. Like, I can't do that and I live in Thunder Bay. I'm like, how do these guys from Georgia do it or wherever? Uh, it's freezing. It's freezing. So you can either enclose the tree stand um, or get really, really, really good warm clothes. Warmer weather, I love tree stands. You get a great, you know, especially if you're uh, bow hunting. But you just get a fantastic view. But you can enclose tree stands, and, they, and they're a little more windproof anyway. Okay, baiting and trail cams. Uh, trail cams are amazing. Who has trail cams here? Are they amazing? You guys spend tons of time like looking at trail cam pictures. Like it's become an issue in our house. I won't lie. Are you looking at trail cam pictures again? Yep, I am. I, I love them. I just uh, I'm absolutely fascinated with what they tell you. And, and, and bait and trail cams, you don't ha obviously you can put trail cams anywhere. I mean, I put them on swamps to watch moose. I put them on well-used trails. But baiting and trail cams goes together very well. Some of the things about trail cams, well, all the big ones at night, right? Am I right? A lot of small deer during the day, and does and fawns. Great pictures of small deer. Now, this, cha this does change normally. Usually when you're not there, but um, I have a lot of nighttime pictures of beautiful bucks, lots of them. Trail cams also re reveal your errors. Okay, this is November 16th. I have some favorite days I like to hunt. Uh, November 4th has been a good month uh, or good uh, date for me. That's a pre-rut. Uh, Remembrance Day. I've always had great luck uh, hunting on Remembrance Day. November 16th is maybe one of the very best days over the course of however long I've been hunting deer. November 16th last year in Thunder Bay, when I woke up in the morning, it was 20, minus 26 Celsius. And that's without the wind chill. It was unbelievably cold. 
So I went and sat. I have, as I said, I have two properties. I went and sat on the other property till noon. Even with a heater, I was freezing. I said, okay, I can't do this anymore. I'm going home. I went to the other property the next day and checked my, my camera. Um, so at 11.13, a, a deer I had been watching all year came out at, uh, I think it was about 11, yeah, 11.13, nine point. So that was a fail. I wasn't there. And then uh, 2 o'clock, an, an 11 point that I'd been watching for two years came out, and uh, I was at home because it was cold out. <laughs> so that was a double fail on November 16th of that year. But I do have the pictures to prove it, that, that it was a fail. So I can revel in my failures. But um, trail cams, trail cams are, are awesome but painful. And then occasionally you get unfortunate pictures um, that I'm still not sure what this is. Um, I, I have some ideas what this is, but you can't unsee this, right? So trail cams to show you everything. Um, and now, just uh, I've mentioned cold weather and toughing it out. Uh, again, this is this, uh, this past year. I hunted really, really hard this past November, and I, was, I, I took a couple antlerless deer, but I mean, I just wasn't having any luck with bucks. I ended up going to, uh, to do a hunt that, that I'll uh, probably write about later. I was in Dryden, and uh, Dryden is famous for bucks, right? We've heard of the Dryden buck, and it, it, they're phenomenally big deer there. So anyway, um, it was just unbelievably cold, though, like, November, we had two record cold months in uh, northwestern Ontario this year, November and February. They both sucked. They were both awful. November was off the hook cold. So when I was hunting, I brought my son Austin up. It was about, the average daily temperature was like minus 25. And like, I know it's dry cold, right? But it was brutal. Anyway, so Austin and I sat in this this blind for two and a half days waiting for this buck to come out because I wanted him to shoot it. That was the plan. He was going to shoot the buck. And we waited and it was just unbelievably cold. We went from morning to dark sitting. So all day sits. And then Austin, who's a carpenter, had to go back to work. And then uh, the next morning, I sat by myself. Guess what? Right? Ten point walks out. I, sh I, sh I shot it. I wish I wanted him to take it, but I was happy to take it. One, one other thing I'll mention about baiting, um, besides the fact that, you know, you can attract deer in, um, bait really brings in does and fawns. Bucks will hit it too, but they're far more uh, careful about it, and they tend to circle the periphery, and that's exactly what this guy did. He didn't go to the bait at all. He was actually well away from it, but he was chasing a doe that was in the area, and he chased that doe out, and then he came out. Um, I never actually saw this deer other than that. We saw, we saw a little bit of movement, but uh, other deer were hitting the bait and, and stuff, but he didn't. Um, one of the things that I really like about hunting over bait for deer is that you get incredibly clean shots on deer. Like this guy dropped in his tracks. I shot another buck on this hunt. He dropped in his tracks. You have time, and uh, that's a huge, huge thing. Okay, uh, just uh, some other, uh, how are we doing here? Uh, positives for baiting, you draw deer in a, a central area, especially in thick bush. Uh, some of the areas I hunt are just unbelievably gross with cedars and, and thick. You can't really, uh, you can't still hunt in it really, but the, the, the baiting areas, it definitely draws the deer out, so that's a good thing. Um, draws in does, and ultimately the bucks, sure they'll hit it too, but they follow the does during the, uh, during the rut. And you can pull in bucks in the post-rut period because when the rut's over, those bucks are hungry because they've just been doing nothing but run for about a month. So they're hungry. So right near the end of the season, depending on, we have an incredibly generous hunting season in northwestern Ontario. We hunt right till December 15th. Our bow hunt, I think, starts September 10th or something like that. So we have this huge long season. But if you have a late season hunt, those bucks will be hungry for sure. Negatives can be expensive, especially if you're uh, buying, you're, like I have a deal with a farmer where I buy large numbers of a large amount of oats for not that much money, but if you're just buying the bags, it can be really expensive. Um, deer do become very wary around baits. 
because you ultimately have human scent associated with it. That's just a fact if you're going there regularly. One thing I do is I don't drive an ATV in. I carry my bait in. Um, it's a good way to get in shape, folks. You want to carry 60-pound uh, bags on your shoulder and pumpkins, too, as you can see in this picture. Um, it's quite a workout. But I don't drive my ATV in. I, I carry it in. Um, and, and deer will become nocturnal around baits. There's no doubt about it, especially... If you don't have timed feeders, they'll just wait till the sun goes down and they just pound it all night. So those are downsides, but there's lots of upsides to it. Baiting or not, well, timing is everything. This is uh, my son, Devin. Okay, what time is it here? This is uh, one in the afternoon, so we'd hunted all morning. Okay, Dad, I got to go home and sleep. So uh, one o'clock, he walks out. The deer comes out at 2.58. So timing is everything. Again, trail cam reveal, revealing failures. Um, rut timing. Well, bucks tend to become active around the end of October, uh, for sure. Like, and again, you can often see this if, you're, if you put trail cams up. You'll uh, see does and fawns. You may get a view of a buck in velvet or something. You won't see as much. And then magically around the end of October, the bucks start appearing, at least where I hunt. And then in November, it's just like the floodgates open. Um, Pre-rut activity, you know, November 1st to 8th, that's when they're starting to chase and they're starting to get really interested in, uh, it's a good time to rattle and call, I find, that period. Uh, November 9th to 14th, very active rut. Um, as I said, November 11th has been one of my personally uh, best days. I know uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Gustafson, who runs for the, uh, writes for Ontario Doors, November 11th, uh, his uh, best day, he does some outfitting, that's, uh, Great day for him. But this is interesting, and, and this is something really I only picked up on the last few years. And again, this is partially because of trail cams. Uh, some of the largest bucks decloak. And when I say that, I mean the night walkers, the ones that never seem to um, be out during the day, suddenly are out during the day. And, th and that period of time, November 14th to 20th in there. And I'm not sure what that is, if they're just, you know, trying to chase the last few unbred does. Um, they, some of these big boys suddenly appear. And late November activity generally slows down. Uh, peak rut, I said November 11th. There's Devin again going home for a nap. What time is it? Uh, 2.05, 3.50, the uh, buck walks out. So, again, trail cams reve revealing fails. November 11, 2013, there's my uh, dad again and myself. We sat from uh, sunup to sundown, another brutal freezing day with wind, um, and waited all day long. I saw four, four does come out. I, I had antlerless, but I didn't take them because I knew that there was a buck that was coming in. I had literally, I think it was a minute and a half to go in last light, and this uh, nine point walked out, and I took it. And that was November 11th. So on a good day, you, on a day that you've had good success, traditionally, and if you know there's deer around, it's worth the wait, although it can be, I don't know how many of you have sat in a ground blind all day when it's really cold. It's mind over matter, baby. It's zen. It's, you get into zen mode. It's, uh, it's something. So uh, Night Walker appears. Again, this is, what's the date here? November 20th. So there's a monster buck I've watched for years. He's still around. Uh, I've never actually seen this guy. Um, he's a true Night Walker. Tons of pictures of him. And then this particular year, he uh, was wide open at uh, 11 in the afternoon, or 11 in the morning on November 20th. Of course, I wasn't there. I was probably working or something, but uh, he came out. Okay, I'm just going to quickly go through this stuff. Uh, this, this is some Northwestern Ontario stuff, but these are just some monster bucks. Obviously, the one on the left there, that's what it's called the Dryden buck that was poached. Uh, and not by this gentleman, by the way. He just happened to uh, be in the picture, but... Um, I was an absolute monster buck. There's a, on the right, there's Bill Draper, our friend from Toronto, uh, with, a, again, a Dryden buck, just a huge one from a couple years ago. Fort Francis Emo has a great, very, uh, very much country, um, farm country around there, sort of a mixed hardwoods. Great hunting there. Uh, on the left, that's a friend of mine, Jeff Stanky from Fort Francis. On the, on the right, there's my dad again. On this particular hunt, that, uh, my, my father has amazing luck with crazy things. He uh, saw two bucks fighting. He was in a ground blind, saw two bucks fighting. 
decided to take one of them, shot it, sh buck went down, and then the other buck started dragging it off because they were locked. They were locked. I had a tag. So the other buck went down. So a 10 point and a 13 point. How's that for uh, a morning hunt, right? And he'd already, he'd already dropped a doe that morning. So, yeah. So that's the Fort Francis Emo country, country. Great uh, deer hunting there. Here's an absolute monster. Uh, There's a guy named Dave Bennett who's an outfitter near Kenora. Um, just a stupid monster buck. Crazy. And again, these are, these are deer that are way back in the, in the woods, in, in moose country, really. Just huge things. Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay has really become one of the uh, premier, these are just a few of, over the years of pictures I've collected. The uh, guy on the left there, uh, his name's John Price. He's from Thunder Bay. He was out moose hunting and saw this huge buck and shot it. And it was just crazy. And there's one on the right that was taken near Chabacqua a couple years ago. Um, and nipping in the North Shore now, the last few years they had really bad winters and they've been knocked down a bit, but there's some huge, huge, huge bucks there. And not a lot of them, again, this is traditional, like uh, some of you might hunt Unit 21, there's been a lot of tags there for moose the last few years. There's pockets of deer there that are pretty impressive. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my uh, presentation. I'd be happy if you have any questions to take. Uh, thank you. I've answered all the questions. You guys are good to go? All right, well, thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, all of us here, uh, I want to thank Gord for uh, being with us today. I know that uh, most of us uh, take the time to read his column in, in that great magazine, OOD. I certainly look forward to, to it every month. So we appreciate the fact that he traveled down here to be with us this morning. And thanks again, Gord. Thank you, Greg. I think this oh. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, very good presentation, anyways. Thank you. And uh, I'm Roy Polsky for Val Karen. When you're doing uh, grunt or bleat calls, uh, how many uh, grunts would you do and what's the frequency of them? I always, um, always think less is more for anything, whether it's moose calling or, you know, with, with the understanding that in the wilds, sometimes, like I've heard bucks walk from one side of a cut to the other doing nothing but grunt the whole time. But I generally will just do three or four and it'll be something like along this. Just sort of a repetitive sound. Like sometimes you'll, in the woods, you'll hear them just do a sing single one. Um, but when they're tending and or, or if they're behind a, a doe, they'll do sort of a repetitive thing. And I've seen, I've actually seen them, you know, get behind a doe and just do that weird sound. But less is more, generally. Same as rattling. Uh, rattling I'll do, um, I mean, I've heard deer fight for 15 minutes, but I'll just like, I'll do that for like 15, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, then I'll stop and I'll wait like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Or then I might just, just do a little, what's called tickling, just a, just the tips, that kind of sound, and then wait. Waiting, waiting's the big part, just wait, you know, being patient and watching. Like, again, you'll see, all of a sudden you'll just see a leg in the bush where this, bucks don't generally come running. Sometimes they do. Uh, my dad, uh, again, another huge buck. I don't have a picture of it in this presentation, but it's actually a record book buck. He, he called it rattling in, and that thing ran to him. And it was a monster. But it was the dominant buck in the whole area, and so it was just going to come and kick some butt. But mostly they sneak in. They'll move pretty quickly. What would be the frequency? Would you do it every hour, every... Um, I had 20, 20 minutes. I'll wait 20 minutes and do it. And I'll do a few rounds, and if nothing happens, then I'll generally move, unless I'm in, like, in a blind. Um, there, are, there are no rules because animals don't have rules, but generally you don't want anything. I'll, I'll do less is more gen, as a general rule. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>